So I have um, four presentations to do, um, probably three today and one tomorrow. And um, they're all basically on Revelation 9. And so I've just got a, a, brief, a brief overview of what we're going to do. Um, so today we're going to do basically a part defence of Josiah Litch in August 11, 1840. And also partly an exploration of some new aspects that seem to have come to light that are connected with that prophecy. Um, what we're going to be ultimately looking at is a chiastic structure that seems to have sort of grown up around the first and second woes, and also a few um, sort of seven thunders scenarios that seem to be connected with that as well. So it's probably going to be a lot of information and I don't really understand all of it and it's basically a lot of observation. You know, there's, there's places where I don't really have conclusions or know really how to apply it but I think that it is significant. So we'll start with um, the first one is really just an overview of Josiah Litch and it's looking at some criticisms that there have been of, of his understanding of Revelation 9 and just a few answers to those and a bit of a, a bit of an extension of a few things as well. So it's not going to be a terribly in-depth study. There are lots of things that you can look at in Revelation 9 and if I took time to prove all of them I wouldn't be able to make the points that I want to make. So I'm really just going to be proving the things that are essential to the points that I'm going to make. So we hold to the historicist understanding of the trumpets in this movement and it is, it's crucial to both Josiah Litch and August 11, 1840 and it's crucial to our movement as well. And we know that um, it's a position that's very much under attack. But um, I think that just about everything can be explained by... Um, ignorance whether willful or not. <laughs> so we're just going to move through Revelation 9 and is there a whiteboard marker anywhere? Ah, thank you. Sorry, I'm a bit... So what we're just going to do is put up the basic structure of Revelation 9 in terms of the woes and the trumpets. And we're just going to start reading through Revelation 9. So we'll start with Revelation 9 verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So we know in Bible prophecy that a star is a symbol of an angel or a messenger, and not necessarily a righteous messenger. And in this case, it is Muhammad, the founder of Islam. So he is an unrighteous messenger, the star that falls. And this was in the year 606 AD. We have Muhammad fall, the, the star falling, which is Muhammad, and he is our fifth trumpet. The key that he has is the Battle of Nineveh in 627 AD. This was quite an interesting and famous battle. Um, 
It was between, it was a war between um, the Sassanids or the Persians and Eastern Rome or the Byzantines, two big superpowers and it was a very long drawn out war um, and what happened was that the, the Byzantines were able to sort of uh, come in from behind and do a bit of a surprise attack and they actually managed to turn the whole thing in their favour and win that war. So we put that as the key. Now, it's, that's an interesting story in itself, but the reason that it's relevant to this study is because Muhammad is related to that um, series of events. As he was rising sort of in, in the region south of, of where this was playing out um, in, in, the, in the Middle East, he actually sent an ambassador to Khosrows, the leader of the Persians, and invited him to acknowledge him as the Epistle of Muhammad, Apostle of Muhammad, sorry. Um, and Khosrows responded by tearing up the, uh, the letter and when Muhammad heard this he said, it is thus that God will tear the kingdom and reject the supplication of Khosrows. And so in a sense it was kind of a prophecy. He was correct. And he went on further to say that he um, believed that the victory would turn to the Romans and that's precisely what happened. And so that was the Battle of Nineveh and that is exactly what happened. So once those two superpowers had finished that war and the Persians were um, ebbed away, the way was then open for Muhammad to rise. So we'll look at that next. And there's just a, a little quote here about the Battle of Nineveh, which is quite interesting because it mirrors Revelation so nicely. The Battle of Nineveh was the climactic battle of the last Roman-Persian wars between the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire in 627. The Byzantine victory broke the power of the Sassanid dynasty and for a period of time restored the empire to its ancient boundaries in the Middle East. This resurgence of power and prestige was not to last, however, as within a matter of decades, as an Islamic caliphate emerged from the Arabian desert and once again brought the empire to the brink of destruction. So um, I have the reference here. Uh, it's a link. So I'm not going <laughs> I'm not going to read out the letters of the link. So we'll move on to verse two. And he, Muhammad opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So the smoke as we understand, um, as we understand this symbology is the religion of Islam which um, spread like smoke throughout the Middle East and it went around darkening the sun and the air of the gospel. Of the gospel. Um, And one important thing to remember is that this smoke is relating to Islam in a general sense, not a specific sense in terms of Arabic Islam. If you limit yourself that way, you'll find that you can make mistakes, one in how to apply the symbols and also to the different groups that it can apply to. So we'll, we'll get into that. Verse 3, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So locusts are a symbol of Islam, and I will establish that. And it's worth saying here as well, again, it's part of this being able to identify the different Islamic groups that are in Revelation 9, and how they actually apply to those. So we'll put locusts as a symbol of Islam. <coughs> so 
So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis 25. And we'll start from verse 1. Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua, etc., etc. And we'll go down to verse 6. But the sons of the, of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. So east in the direction of the east is another symbol of Islam. And we only read the first line of their sons because we're focusing on Midian. So I think there are actually quite a few um, of these uh, descendants of these who you can trace back as being related to Islam and to the Arabic tribes, but we're focusing on Midian. So go to Judges 6. And we'll read from verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them excuse me, the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And it was so when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and all the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. So we have here these Midianites, which we know are the sons of Abraham, which he sent away to the east. Here we have them being compared to grasshoppers. And that's the way that it is translated in the Hebrew, but in the Greek, in the New Testament, it's translated as locust. So it's the same thing. So you have locusts slash grasshoppers. Judges 7 verse 12 is another reference to this. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. So again, we have this connection between grasshoppers, Midian and the children of the east. So of course, um, we always trace Islam right back to Ishmael. So go to Genesis 16 and verse 11. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, that's Hagar, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. Verse 12. And he will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So when you look at the literal definition of the word wild here, um, you can look at Strong's Hebrew number 6501 and it is wild ass. So literally it is, he will be a wild ass of a man. And I have another quote here just from Wikipedia. The onager is a species of the family of Equidae, that's the horse family, native to Asia. Unlike most horses and donkeys, onagers have never been domesticated. Onagers are notoriously untamable. So we have this being used as a symbol for a people that cannot be tamed. So we've got horse family. So 
And also, um, this quote, this verse, sorry, indicates that they're going to, there's going to be a lot of strife and warfare associated with these people. <coughs> so we'll go back to Revelation 9 and verse 4. And it was commanded them, just one second, have we done? Yep. No, verse 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And so Josiah Litch made the connection between this verse and a letter that was given by Abu Bakr, who was the leader of Islam after Muhammad. This was a letter that he sent out to all the, the tribesmen. And so I'll just read a part of it. When you fight your battles of the Lord, acquit yourselves like men without turning your backs, but let not your victory be stained with the blood of women and children. Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn. Cut down no fruit, fruit trees, nor do any mischief to cattle, only such as you kill to eat. So if we just take this part. Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn. Cut down no fruit trees. And now let's step back over to verse 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. So you can see a, a strong connection between those two commands. And we'll keep going with the quote. As you go on, you will find some religious persons who live retired in monasteries and propose to themselves to serve God that way. Let them alone and neither kill them nor destroy their monasteries. And you will find another sort of person that belong to the synagogue of Satan who have shaven crowns. Be sure that you cleave their skulls and give them no quarter till they either turn Mohammedans or pay tribute. So this is a different class of, of um, person. And when we go back to verse 4, and we'll read from the colon onwards, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. We read the whole verse. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So you can line up this group of people with the group of people referenced in the in the quote from Abu Bakr. And interestingly, you can, um, you can take that a little further. It was part of the outfit of the, um, the habit and the dress of the Catholic monks to shave the, their crowns. It was called a tonsure. And so they would shave the top of their head and just leave their fringe. And it was supposed to be uh, symbolic of uh, like a holy crown. But I think that's a clear reference to that group of people. So you can see from the very beginning um, Islam being set against Catholicism. And Muhammad is the fifth trumpet and he's designated as a symbol for um, the entirety of the fifth trumpet. However, it comes in two phases. One thing that we need to be really careful of is that we don't consider a woe to be a trumpet or a trumpet to be a woe. It's two phases of the trumpet. So this here is the fifth trumpet and this here is the first woe. This is Arabic Islam up to this point. And we're going to move into something different. So Abu Bakr's command was directed to Arabic Islam, which was restrained from destroying Rome. But in the second phase of the fifth trumpet, which is the first woe, we'll see a different group of Muslims being addressed. So we'll read verse 5. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. 
So it's an easy mistake to make here is that this verse is referring to the locusts of the, of the previous two verses and those exclusively. Because if you do that, you'll find that it, it's, um, it sets you on the wrong track. We'll, we'll, we'll look at this. One of the problems that you have if you, if you mix up this verse is that you end up with two 150-year periods and or only one group of Muslims. So we have to, to interpret this verse in such a way as it gives us two groups of Islamic powers and one 150-year period. So I'm just going to write this verse up. And to them, it was given that they should not kill them That might do. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. So when you read on, when you read verse four and five together, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, etc you can get the impression that it's only talking about the locusts. And so we have to understand that there are two groups being referred to in verse 5. And I'm just going to, rather than muddle myself up, I'm just going to write it out. So the first them, <coughs> this them, is the locusts. Muddled up. Just give me a second. No, that was right. Yep. Thank you. This one. This is the unsealed men. this one. And this is That is the unsealed men. So if we were to read the verse as it should be read, it would be like this. And to them, I'm getting this all mixed up.
this seemed so easy when I, when I was <laughs> thinking this out by myself. That they, the locusts. Okay, I think that's it. Yes, okay. I've got it. The first them here, you would naturally think was referring back to the locusts. The, the Arabic Islam, the locusts of the previous verse. And if you look at it that way, and, and you read the verse through to the five months, it looks as though this group has their own five months. But if you understand this to be the unsealed men, because remember, when, when we go back to the verse, there were two groups being referred to. Verse 4. And it was commanded them, this is the locusts, that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, etc., through to the colon, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So there's two groups being referred to in verse 4. It's, it's sort of an intuitive thing, or a misguided intuitive thing, to, to refer back to the locusts as being the only subject of the next verse. But if you look closely, the first them is the unsealed men. So if we were to read it that way, and to the unsealed men, it was given that they, the locusts, should not kill them, the unsealed men, but that they, but that they the unsealed men, should be tormented five months. So this way, when you, when you sort your pronouns out, which are a little bit ambiguous, you can see that there are two groups being referred to here. And what this does is allows us to sort out how many 150 year periods there are. And the other thing it allows us to do is understand that what's being emphasized in Revelation 9 verse 5 is the experience of those that are being inflicted with this torment. That is the main purpose of this verse. Really, the, the main topic of this verse is the unsealed men. So we're looking at the experience of the unsealed men being tormented over that one single 150 year time period. And this also is the, the time period when they can, we can get rid of that now. So this is the hurt or torment stage. because they're restrained from actually destroying Rome over this, this first period of the, of the fifth trumpet. Verse 6, And in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Verse 7, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, We've got here again this idea of horses being tied to Islam. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. You can tie those verses to lots of uh, little bits and pieces, but I'm just going to stick to the points that I'm making. Um, verse 8, And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, verse 10. They had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. See, we here have another reference to this five-month period, and that's why people make the mistake that there are two 150 time periods. Uh, they, they either apply it that the first 150-year time period applies to Arabic Islam and the second one to Ottoman Islam or they say that it's just anyway I won't get into all the <laughs> let's just try and <laughs> stick to the script but here we have our second reference to this five month period and this verse is very simple it's all referring to the to the locusts and the scorpions and their power was to hurt men five months so this verse emphasizes the experience of those who are inflicting the torment so the first verse Verse 10 emphasizes the experience of those who, who experience the torment. It's inflicted upon them. 
and the second verse is referring to those who actually inflict that torment. So that's why there's two references. And I'm sure we all understand here how we arrived at this 150 year time period in the first place. It's the five months, so we, we look at it um, prophetically using a, a Hebrew um, reckoning. So a month has 30 days. So five months, five times 30, that's 150 days. And then with the year day principle, we change that to years. So it's 150 years. And we commence this um, 150-year period here it starts at a very precise point in time it's the 27th of July 1299 which is the commencement of the first woe and the reason we can do this we can make this really precise application is because of an understanding of um, the way the Ottoman power came together and when they first made their um, assault on the Romans. So we'll read on to verse 11 of Revelation 9. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So this king is Ottoman I, who was the first sultan who unified um, his Turkic warriors into um, a, a state power. So he actually was a king over this Islamic power. And they made their first attack upon the Eastern Romans um, on the 27th of July, 1299, with the Battle of Nicomedia. And we can add another um, characteristic of Islam here. The Greek, sorry, the... Abaddon in the Hebrew and Apollyon in the Greek, it's death and destruction in Revelation 9, 11. So that's a definite, we can tie that to our understanding of Islam. So And the first woe in the fifth trumpet, they end simultaneously on this date. So both these phases come to an end at this point, which is um, the next phase. Revelation 9, verse 12. One woe is past, and behold, there come two more woes hereafter. So William Miller and Josiah Litch did something interesting and different, which is, um, it was a concept that was lacking from the broader Protestant understanding of Revelation 9, because a lot of what we have here was actually standard Protestant understanding of Revelation 9. Um, but they couldn't really pin down any definite dates or make up their minds about what applied to who and all that sort of thing. But what Miller and Litch did was come up with a few new ideas which gave them a framework that they could put definite dates on. And so when you've got that structure in place, it means that you've got something that you can test, which is what they did. So one of the new ideas that they had was to run the woes continuously from each other. So this is the second woe here. And you can see that the second woe begins on the very day that the first woe ends. So this was a new thing. No one else had thought of this idea before, to run these two woes, one consecutively and continuously from the other. And their reasoning for doing this was that they thought Using, using the imagery and the symbolism of what had been said previously, 
all this um, talk of torment and hurt um, and torture, they thought that the death of Eastern Rome would have to follow very quickly after the torture. So the hurt phase was the, was the torture phase and the death would have to follow very swiftly afterwards. So they, they um, joined those two, they connected them up. Um, chapter 9, verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, this is through to verse 14, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So this was a geographical clue for Josiah Litch as he was going through and decoding the symbolism. The river Euphrates indicated to him that particular region in the Middle East and he looked at um, four regions about that, um, Aleppo, Iconium, Damascus and Baghdad. And so he, he took those four angels to be representatives of those regions. And we have a quote here, it's from Signs of the Times, February 1, 1841. The four angels denote ministers of judgment. They refer to the four nations of the Seljukan Turks, of which the Ottoman Empire was composed, located near the river Euphrates at Aleppo, Iconium, Damascus and Baghdad. I'll just put that reference up. Revelation 9 verse 15, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. So it's really all aiming towards this verse and this um, command, if you like, this purpose and this prediction. <coughs> this is what Josiah Litch hung his, his um, August 11 prediction upon. So this was the test of those new ideas that they were formulating. So what is the third part of men? Um, so we, we, we're going to refer to Prophetic Expositions by Josiah Litch, page 133. I'm not sure what the code is for this. The Empire after Constantine was divided into three parts and hence the frequent remark, a third part of men, etc., in allusion to the third part of the empire which was under the scourge. Under the first four trumpets, the two western divisions fell and under the fifth and sixth, the eastern empire was crushed. But under the seventh trumpet, great Babylon entire will sink to rise no more at all. So it's interesting that he also reserves a spiritual application for the, the seventh trumpet. But what we really want to pick up here is the Eastern Empire was crushed. Uh, under the first four trumpets, the two Western divisions fell. Under the fifth and sixth trumpets, the Eastern Empire was crushed. So that's the Eastern division of the Roman Empire. That's the third part of men that we're dealing with here. And so this is, when we go back to verse 15, this is the third part of men that is to be slain. That's the event that we're looking for. And of course, um, it's another time prophecy. So we had those two references to the 150 years of the first woe. So now we have a similar thing here for the second woe. And we're going to be using Hebrew reckoning to formulate a prophetic application of time again. So <clears throat> a year is 360 days. A month is 30 days. A day is obviously one day. And we'll get to this. So we're going to change it all to years. So you end up with 391 days. which we're going to change to years. 
and prophetically an hour is 15 days. So we end up with 15 days. We, we might as well just put it like that. That's better. So you end up with 391 literal years and 15 days. That's how you understand verse 15. And that's why the, the Battle of Nicomedia was so important. And that's why this junction was so crucial. Because if these run continuously from each other, then it all hinges on the starting point, which was another place where they really went out on a limb and, and tried something new. So the whole structure, if any part of it fails, and the whole thing falls down. So these were the new ideas that had to work to have any success at all. And so this is what um, was really tested and proven with August 11. Oops. <laughs> what am I doing? Way too long. So this is how Josiah Litch put it. The time during which they were to continue their conquests, this is the Ottoman Turks, was an hour, 15 days, a day, one year, a month, 30 years, and a year, 360 years, the whole amounting to 391 years and 15 days. Allowing the first period, the 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled before dear Cozies ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 391 years, 15 days, commenced at the close of the first period, it will end on August 11, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken, and this, I believe, will be found to be the case. So that's Signs of the Times, August 1, 1840. And again, we have to make sure we're straight here that the second woe is not the sixth trumpet. It's a part of it. So this is the entirety of the sixth trumpet. And the second woe is a portion of it. And just jumping back for a second, we had this, this hurt and torment phase, which was to be, um, and here as well, they were restrained but they were thereafter allowed to destroy the third part of men. So this becomes the kill phase, where they were a actually able to destroy the third part of men. So Rome was destroyed by the Ottomans after a siege in 1453 just four years into the second woe. So the main event of the second woe was achieved quite quickly. They still had other purposes for the, the duration of that period, but the main event happened shortly into the second woe. So verse 16 of Revelation 9, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. So Josiah Litch speculates that this enormous number is um, in reference to the entirety of all the, the, cell, the um, warriors over the entirety of the woe, which would make sense because it, it's, um, I think it's too large to be literal in that instance, which was when Constantinople was destroyed. So something interesting that 
Ottomans had, and which is referred to in, in the chapter as well, is their new forms of warfare. Um, I have a quote here from Prophetic Expositions, page 185. Among the implements of destruction, he studied with particular care, peculiar care, sorry, and this is in reference to the Sultan who was in charge at the time, the recent and tremendous discovery of the Latins and his, in, and his artillery surpassed whatever had yet appeared in the world. A founder of Canon, a Dane or Hungarian, who had been almost starved in, in the Greek service, deserted to the Muslims and was liberally entertained by the Turkish Sultan. Muhammad was satisfied with the answer to his first question, with which he eagerly pressed on the artist. Am I capable, sorry, am I able to cast a cannon capable of throwing a ball or stone of sufficient size to batter the walls of Constantinople? And he replied, I am not ignorant of their strength, but they were more solid than those of Babylon. I could oppose an engine of superior power. The position and management of that engine must be left to your engineers. Etc. Et At the end of three months, Urban produced a piece of brass ordnance of stupendous and almost incredible magnitude. A measure of 12 palms was assigned to the bore, and the stone bullet weighed about 600 pounds. So that's a 600 pound cannonball. <laughs> it's quite amazing. Verse 19 For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. So what does a tail represent in Bible symbolism? Go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 15. The ancient and honourable, he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. So you've got these So the ancient and honourable, he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. So you have all these Islamic warriors in service of a tail, a false prophet. And then when you go to the verse verse nineteen, for their power is in their mouths. And in their tails, in their mouth, they have all this wonderful new weaponry, these cannons and musketry and all these things. And in their tails, and their tails is a false religion. So they have a, a, the zeal of this false religion. So their power is their weapons and their deluded zeal. Chapter um, verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor, nor walk. 21. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So this appears to me to be quite a good description of the idolatry of the Catholic Church. Um... And it's also quite generally known that Islam is very much opposed to any form of idolatry, um, even to the point where, they, where some um, parts of Islam won't allow photographs to be taken in case those photographs end up being used as idols. And you look at a lot of their artwork from the time and it's just geometric shapes. Again, for the, just for the purpose that there are no figures which might end up being venerated. So you look at the Catholic Church and you look at, at the religion of the Eastern Romans, which was a, essentially Catholicism, but a bit of an offshoot. And they're all about their icons and their um, statues and, and all that sort of thing. So you can see how Islam is, is the perfect enemy of Catholicism because one group won't allow a photograph and the other group are worshipping pictures and, and bits and pieces. So you, you can see the, how... Um, these Islamic warriors were raised up in order to slay the third part of men. So 
So we've had a, a, a really quick look at Josiah Litch's understanding of the, of the woes. But I think it's important to, to um, acknowledge what Ellen White says about Josiah Litch's prediction and his understanding of, the, of um, Revelation 9. So we have the Great Controversy, page 334 and 335. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfilment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in AD 1840, sometime in the month of August, and only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, allowing the first period, 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled before Diakosis ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 391 years, 15 days, commenced at the close of the first period, it will end on the 11th of August, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken, and this, I believe, will be found to be the case. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller, both in preaching and publishing his views. And from 1840 to 1844, the work rapidly extended. So I, I don't think anyone could honestly read that <coughs> and um, think that she wasn't supporting and endorsing his prediction. That's certainly how I read it. <clears throat> so we know that it had the seal of, of approval from Ellen White. One little issue that, that um, Josiah Litch had with his understanding was that he seemed to have the impression that the last emperor of Constantinople actually ascended the throne on this day here. So he seems to have the impression that this event actually occurred on that very day. Um, I haven't been able to track down his sources, but I haven't been able to find anything that indicates that. It, all the sources that you look at will indicate that the last Constantine ascended the throne on the 6th of January of that year. Um, it, it feels a little strange to say something that doesn't quite um, line up with what the pioneers had said. However, if you look at the, um, the charts, and the diagrams of Islam, it's on the, those same charts. You'll see the 6th of January is when Constantine ascends the throne as a different and distinct date from here, which is the start of the, um, third, the, the second woe. So I'm not doing anything different than what's already been established, but I think that it's good to be able to sort out this little um, understanding. So, because people have noticed this, just out, out and about generally in Adventism and beyond, um, people like to use this as a way of discrediting Ellen White as a prophet. They say, Ellen White quotes Josiah Litch, Josiah Litch quotes faulty history, therefore Ellen White is not a prophet. So people do say that, and I think that the answer is quite easy. Um, in the first place, she's just quoting him accurately. She's just saying precisely what he said. That's how he wrote in um, the number of publications that he put this prediction in. So she's just quoting him precisely as, as he expressed himself. And the other thing is that that is, <clears throat> it's really only a minor detail of that whole statement. Like we went over earlier, the main contribution that Miller and Litch had to the understanding of Revelation 9 was this idea that the woes run continuously. That you have a clear start date, you have these two groups, and that these woes end at this point in time. 
So the main thing that was really being tested was the structure that they put together. And when you look at, at how he expresses himself, it can be easy to overemphasize that little bit of history that he puts in there. If we go back and read what he says, he's really putting this structure up to be tested. That's really what he's saying. Allowing the first period, 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled before dear Cozy's ascended the throne by permission of the Turks. And so he has the misconception that that's where dear Cozy's ascended. But what he's really referring to is, is that, what he's really saying is, you know, allowing our assumption to be correct that this period of time begins precisely when this period of time ends. That's the main emphasis of what he's saying. And the 391 years, 15 days, commenced at the close of the first period. It will end on the 11th of August, 1840. So I just think that when Ellen White quotes him, she's also confirming that the new ideas they had were correct. The fact that there's a little mistake in there with an event on a wrong day is irrelevant to the structure that they put in place. And that is what was proven on August 11 because you can't get any one of those dates wrong, the whole thing falls apart. So if the start date is correct and the end date is correct, then it proves this, the novel ideas that they had with how the woes actually work. And that's what she's endorsing, because that was the only thing that had to actually be tested. It was, it was new. So we'll very quickly summarise. So we've looked at Revelation 9 um, from Josiah Litch's historicist point of view and we've seen this dynamic between Eastern Rome and Islam. Um, we've drawn from the OT symbols to establish, um, to back up this idea that it is Islam. We've looked at the fact that there is a, is a single 150 year time period and that the two references are referring, one, to the experience of those who receive the torment, and two, to the experience of those who actually inflict the torment. So we've established that the fifth trumpet covers two um, phases. It's the fifth trumpet as it applies to Arabic Islam, and then as it applies to the first woe, which is Ottoman Islam. The second woe, excuse me, We've established that Ottoman Islam was the power of both the sixth and the second one, sixth trumpet and the second woe. And we've looked at the start point for that. We also have seen that Ellen White agrees with Josiah Litch's understanding of Revelation 9 and has endorsed his prophetic application of, of the chapter. And we've seen that Ellen White, while she quotes Josiah Litch accurately, which includes a minor misconception about his understanding of the history, what she's actually upholding is the new light, um, which came as, <coughs> which came from their idea of putting this structure in place. That's all we have. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for all the wonderful light that you've given us. It is such a strong foundation. We just ask that you would help these things to become clear to our minds and really sink down in our ears and help us to see that the believing, of chil the believing children of God have no cause to be ashamed. Mm. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm.